Good morning, everyone. My name is Pastor Chris, and I want to welcome you to church. I also want to say that I'm so glad that you've joined us for this service today. Today, we're in our second week of our sermon series called Transitioning Well. This sermon series is all about how to navigate difficult transitions well. We all go through transitions in life, but if we know they're coming, we should be prepared to take them head on. When I was in seminary, I had a large project that required me to put my whole life into a spiritual journey timeline. You would think that this would be pretty easy, but it ended up being about 80 pages of work for me. I wasn't even 30 yet, and it was 80 pages. What I remember about that timeline is that many turning points in my life were marked by transition periods. Transitions when I moved, changed friends groups, started jobs, or joined new clubs. The lesson to be learned here is that transitions, whether good or bad, will make a profound impact on your life. So, if you want to learn more about how you can do that well, stick around for the service today. I have some announcements for us as we get ready for service. The first thing is that Mother's Day is almost here. That's right, husbands and kids, this is your first warning. You're welcome. This year, we want to celebrate Mother's Day with a slideshow of our moms. So if you want to be a part of that, send a photo of your choice with your mother, or if you're a mother, send a picture with you and your family to online at astero.church and title it Mother's Day. So get that picture and send it to online at astero.church and we'll put it in our slideshow. We can't wait to see your pictures. The next announcement I have is about service times. Starting May 7th, our live chat services will be changing. For the summer, we'll go down to just one service time at 9 a.m. So if you tune in Sunday morning at 8.15 or 9.45, your new service time will be 9 a.m. If you watch in person, that time will be changing as well. And you can find more online and review those times at astero.church. With that, let's center ourselves for worship today. If you're in our live chat during worship, I encourage you to share one thing that you're thankful for today. If you're watching at a later time, just spend some time with God thanking Him for what He's gifted you. Let's worship. Pick me up, you turn me around, place my feet on solid ground. I thank the Master, I thank the Savior, because you healed my heart, you changed my name, forever free. I'm not the same, I thank the Master, I thank the Savior.
thank you for the music worship team. I hope you spent some time thanking God for what he has given you. For me personally, I often find that even in my hardest times, when I can be thankful, it actually makes me a happier person. Being thankful can bring you joy, believe it or not. Now we're gonna move into a time of giving. I often talk about the fact that we are not trying to ask you for your money here at a Star Church, and that really giving is just a time between you and God. Did you know that Jesus talked about money more than any other single human topic? 15% of his teachings are about money. If nothing else, that should tell you that your money is a huge deal, and it's important that we get it right. How do you get it right then? Well, the first step is realizing that it isn't yours. We are stewards of God's money. And then the next step is to invite Jesus in and ask him what you should do with it. It's his, so we should bring him into the process. That's it. So if you would like to give to Astera Church, you can do so by clicking the link in our chat or by going to our website, astera.church, and clicking the button at the top of the page that says give. Now, let's join together to hear what God has to say to us through Pastor Tim. Good morning, Online Church. This is Pastor Tim. Hey, I want to welcome you this morning. Uh, add my voice to Pastor Chris's. Uh, we're just so glad that you're here and worshiping with us, particularly if you're one of those folks who has uh, headed back after your season here to the heathen north. Hey, go with our blessing. We hope you've arrived well. And man, do what you can to be a blessing uh, where you are this summer. So we are talking about this idea of how to transition or doing transitions well. And last week I tried to make the point that we are all in transition all the time. Transitions are just a natural part of life and that it's important for us to do them, to figure out how to do them and do them well. I talked about John 13 through 17, which is this extended conversation that Jesus had with his disciples the night of the Last Supper, and how in so many ways Jesus was preparing them for the uncomfortable um, transition they were about to face, and he was also preparing himself. And if you read those chapters with that uh, through that lens, and I challenge you to do that. Go back and read John 13 through 17 through the lens of, okay, how is Jesus making transitions and how's he preparing himself for those transitions? Part of the focus of a good transition is, hey, what do we have to do to leave our current situation well? What do we have to do in order to be able to leave here and get where we're going? Of course, you don't always get that choice to work through the whole process. And sometimes I've been with just too many families over the years who, who suddenly lost a loved one through either a medical issue or an accident and in many ways, it made that transition of losing that loved one uh, just so much harder. It's an interesting question of um, sort of which is, better, which is a better way to pass, to go suddenly or to have more of a lingering kind of thing or a buildup. To think of transitions, sometimes it's easier to, to think in extreme cases. And then once you get the perspective that the extremity offers, you just kind of back up from there. So suppose you went to your doctor and your doctor told you, hey, listen, you have a rare untreatable condition and unfortunately, you're gonna suddenly drop dead sometime between seven and 10 days from now. So you have seven to 10 days to live. What would you prioritize to prepare yourself and the people around you for that event? What conversations would you have? What intensity would you have them? Who would you talk to first? Would you make a list of people you wanted to communicate with? What business of getting your affairs in order would you make absolutely sure happened? Who would you insist on seeing personally? Who would get a phone call? 
who might get an email? Would you allow yourself or the others you're speaking with space for grief? Or would you insist on it just being positive? What soul work might you prioritize? What might you have to do internally to do that? Of course, the extreme, the extreme situation I'm describing would add intensity to your situation. And intensity often brings clarity. A longtime hospice nurse compiled a list of the most common regrets of her dying patients. Here's what she said. She said, they often say, I'd wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. Wish I didn't work so hard. She said, virtually every man that she was a nurse to said something along those lines. I wish I'd had the courage to express my feelings. I wish I'd stayed in touch with my friends. I wish I'd let myself be happier. Interesting. Another list from another person included, I wish I wouldn't have compared myself to others so often. I wish I didn't wait to start it tomorrow. Oof. I wish I was content with what I had. I wish I hadn't held on to that grudge. What might some of those be for you if you think through when you're ready to make that transition? Intensity brings clarity, which really, again, makes this conversation Jesus has with his disciples in John 13 through 17 so rich. Because of the intensity of the conversation, there's so much in there packed in. Jesus is preparing himself and his disciples for the transition of the cross and the resurrection. And as I said last week, there's value in taking note of how he prepared them for this transition. He gave them a powerful object lesson by washing their feet and being their servant. He predicted that this transition would be devastating for Judas, and it was. And it would be really hard for everyone else. It would cause them to flee in fear. He comforted them with the assurance of God's faithfulness through the transition. And I want you to hear that because, listen, God is down every road we go. Every transition, God is already down every road we go. He promised them hope on the other side because of the Holy Spirit's presence. And there is hope and comfort. He talked about their ongoing connection. He talked about their mission. He talked about things like the vine and the branches. He promised them, listen, I'm still going to be with you, even though it'll be different. He strongly reiterated, and, and he actually repeated himself, on things that they would need moving forward, like obedience to God's will. And then he restated his purpose. This is why I'm here. And he restated their purpose. So Father sent me, so I'm sending you. And finally he prayed. And he prayed for himself, and he prayed for them. Man, I so wish I could remember the name of the family I did a funeral for a few years ago. It's actually here. The family had three daughters. It was their father's funeral. Uh, they were, uh, <clears throat> the family, the folks only came here a couple months a year and the father passed while they were here and they had a service here. All three of his daughters, they talked, they laughed, and they cried as we planned the memorial service. And all three talked about how their daughter had prepared them individually for his death, even though he had died unexpectedly. He had spoken powerful words of grace and truth over all three of his daughters. I remember thinking, 
how much I wanted my family's experience of my death to be like that if it could be. He had done that transition so well, even though he didn't know when it was coming. Of course, as great an illustration as death can be, it certainly isn't the only transition in life. But the same general principles apply. That's why it's such a good illustration. Whether it's marriage, or having children, or divorce, changing jobs, getting a promotion, moving, finishing school, going back to school, retirement. And then there's all these internal transitions as well. We grow and change as we age. If you've been married for more than, I don't know, two weeks, three weeks, you know that it's, it's different. How many of you have been married a long time? You are not nearly the same person you were, and neither is your spouse. We grow and change as we age. Hopefully, we grow and get more healthy and better adapted to our life as we become more like Jesus. And it's interesting to me, personally, how one of the biggest transitions that Cindy and I have had to make in our marriage came not because of different circumstances, as much from the internal changes that we made as we became healthier human beings. And as we grew, it changed the dynamics between us. And we had to change how we functioned together and functioned with each other. For our church, we're transitioning out of the United Methodist Church after 104 years. And we'll be transitioning into a new Methodist denomination sometime over the summer. For me personally, I will be transitioning out of being a United Methodist pastor after 27 years. So what do we and what do I have to do to transition well? What conversations do we have to have? Who do we need to have them with? What business affairs do we need to get in order to be ready to make this transition well? Because we're transitioning from one thing to another, are we going to allow ourselves to grieve in the midst of the hope and the excitement of the new. For me personally, preparing myself to leave United Methodism, I've compiled a list of 12 people who all will be remaining in the United Methodist Church. And by the way, it just happened to be the same number as Jesus' disciples. I wasn't being all spiritual. But for those people, I've been calling them to say in one form or another that disaffiliation is going to change our relationship. And I'm thankful for them. I'm thankful for our friendships. I'm thankful for the blessing that God has given me through them. And while I'm disaffiliating from the United Methodist Church, I am not in my heart disaffiliating from them. I'm about halfway through those calls and so far They've just been really good conversations. But also as part of my transition, I need to write a really hard letter to several of the powers that be to let them know how their actions have affected me and others. Part of this transition for me was a few hours after we voted uh, on the 16th, I found myself on the swing in the backyard in the dark, and I started to cry. Some of that was stress relief. Some was sorrow. It was all necessary. I've also been preparing myself mentally. I have to make a shift. I have to think differently. It's part of the transition. As a church, I think we primarily need to have conversations and speak to the people who have come before us as members and constituents of Astero Church. We need to express our gratitude to them for the blessings we've received because of their faithfulness, as imperfect as it was. And that's another part of doing transitions well. We don't have to pretend 
that what we're leaving is better than it was. And we can celebrate that in spite of the fact that it was imperfect, it was still good and God still used it. I often say at funerals that it would be um, unjust, not right. It would be wrong to present the person in such a way that if someone came to their funeral but they didn't know them, they would walk out believing they were a saint because they weren't saints. They were a mixed bag like the rest of us with struggles and regrets and weaknesses and sins that easily entangled them. I know that because it's a universal truth for all of us. All of us on this side of heaven are that way. It's the same with people who came before us and populated the seats in this church that you now sit in. And it'll be the same for people who look back on us. By God's grace and their faithfulness, we're here. And by God's grace and your faithfulness, Hopefully, people will be here for another 104 years worshiping and serving God on this property. So it's going to be important for us to thank them and to thank God for them. That's why we're going to do that in person on May 31st. That's the last night that we are going to be a United Methodist Church. At midnight on June 1st or midnight at the end of May 31st, we will no longer be a United Methodist Church. So we're gonna have a potluck meal together on that Wednesday night. And then we're gonna have a memorial service for Estero United Methodist Church, where we celebrate the life and we grieve the loss and we take stock of the blessing we've received through this church. It will be a rite of passage for us so we can leave well. Part of that ceremony, however, will be our letting go of our past and our trusting God with our future. You have to do that in any significant transition. You have to eventually let go of the past and trust God with your future. Another rite of passage uh, for this church will be the emblems of the cross and flame we've lived under for so long, they're gonna be removed. Some of them already have been. The last will be the flame on the front wall of the sanctuary, and that'll be removed after the service on May 28th. While there's excitement about that, about where we're going and what God's gonna do, there's also grief. Things are changing, and change is hard. It's always been hard. And here's where we can allow ourselves some space for grief, because grief is an important part of leaving well. Some good people who we love have left this church because of this transition. Like all transitions, some have done it better than others. While I understand and I want to offer whatever assistance we can to help them leave well, it's still sad, because without them, we're diminished. It's sad that we have to leave the denomination. I expect a few more will leave when we decide where we're going at the end of June, which will also be sad. And we will again be diminished. This stuff is hard. I was reminded that, uh, of that again this week when I had a random conversation the other day with a woman who works in an office of an upper, at an upper level of the United Methodist Church. And as we talked about disaffiliation, she began to weep on the phone with me. She was weeping for the church she loved, for how hard it's been on her team, for just the difficulty of it all. This is really hard stuff. And here's the thing, if we don't leave well, and walk away having done what we need to do, we won't be ready to arrive well, to get there where you're going. You have to leave well so you can arrive well. But arriving well is next week's topic. So let me flip it back to you here. 
Let me ask you where you are now. What transitions are you facing? What do you need to do to leave well? What conversations do you need to have? And who do you need to have them with? And at what intensity? What mental shifts do you need to make? What doors do you need to close so that your hands are free, so that you can open others? And another interesting question, what transitions do you wish you could go back and do over again better? Are there any that you need to go back and finish so you truly can leave well? When I think of that, I think of, uh, of my own father's passing. I was 26 years old when my dad died and there was a lot of things that were unsaid. I tried to say them the best I could, but I just couldn't in those days. And so I have periodically uh, gone and stood at my dad's grave and said the things that I've needed to say. Uh, sometimes it's just been sadness that he's not here and all the things that he's missed. I so wish he would have hung around long enough to meet my kids and my grandkids. He would have loved them and they would have loved him. Sometimes it's been about some of the harder things between us. And I've had to give him back some of the things that he gave to me that, sh that weren't mine to carry. Sometimes it's just been expressing love. And so even if you didn't do the transition well previously for whatever reason, you can still do the work to leave well so you can arrive well. So what transitions are you facing? What intensity do you need to give to get those done and done well? Think about it, pray about it, ask God to help you see, and then do the work. Do the work and trust God because he's on the other side, no matter what. Let's pray. Well, Jesus, I'm thankful, I really am. I'm thankful that you help us in all of our transitions. Lord, help us to leave well as a church from the United Methodist Church. We trust that you've led us to where we are. We trust the process that you put us through and that we went through to get to where we are. And we trust that you're ahead of us. But help us now to be about the important work of leaving well. And Lord, that's for us as a church, us as individuals. If there are places where we're in transition, help us to do that well. Help us to figure out, prompt us with what we need to be able to do that. If there are places we need to go back and finish transitions we didn't do well, then I pray you would help us to do that as well. And that we would be able to do that in such a way that brings you glory and allows us to grow. In all these things, Lord, superintend us with your grace, move in front of us and behind us, and help us in each and every moment, we pray in your name, amen. So, I really hope you have a good week. Really hope that this is helpful for you as you think about and contemplate in God's presence what transitions do I need to work through? And then allow God to work. And just a quick reminder, uh, cooperation is key. Cooperation is key. God won't force you to do anything, but he will invite you again and again to cooperate with him. I pray you'll do that. Have a great week. Thank you for that sermon, Pastor Tim. Transitioning well is not an easy thing to do, and leaving well is difficult too. But what did you take away from this sermon, and how can you use what you learned 
to help you through the next transition in your life. Think about these things and pray that God would grow you and challenge you in the process. Now, let's receive the benediction. May the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Thanks for being with us. Have a wonderful week.